So, hello everybody, and good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, everybody, especially the US people who had a very, very long weekend. Uh, that's, I guess you're all getting settled back into work now. Uh, my name is Suzanne Holliday. I'm the Senior Principal Product Manager for Exadata Database Service on Dedicated Infrastructure Based Database and Based, um, based Database Service, which are available in Oracle Database Service for Azure. And I have a multi-cloud specialism. And this is in this session, this is going to be the focus today. Uh, we'll be focusing on optimizing the flow of the network traffic with hub and spoke topology which Oracle Database Service for Azure users. Um, I just wanna highlight that what we're actually not gonna get into is how to set up a hub and spoke network itself uh, in Azure, um, because obviously uh, most of you are familiar with that. But what we're really focusing on today is uh, the network flow. And because if it's really not configured in the correct way, you can experience hanging issues and attempts, uh, sorry, hanging connection attempts. And that's really everything that we're gonna be talking about today and how we're going to be uh, taking this forward, okay? Sorry, Emil, can you please go back and on Safe Harbor slide? Okay, so uh, for the purpose of today's webinar, we're going to be uh, possibly uh, talking about um, some items that may may come into this. All it, all it means is that everything we say today from a product management perspective uh, really can't be held contractually. Okay, move on please, Thomas. I mean, Emil, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so everybody, please let me introduce my guests that I have on today. I'm very delighted to be presenting uh, with Thomas van Borgenhout. Uh, Thomas is a principal solution architect in the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Multi-Cloud team. And uh, Thomas, you've got 25 years of experience and uh, your, your specialization, excuse me, is um, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud and private cloud in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, uh, product management as a certified solution architect and Oracle certified database professional. So welcome. If you just want to say hi. Glad to be here. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me. You're most welcome. And Emil, um, Emil Ramakas is a principal multi-cloud specialist in the Oracle EMEA specialist team. Again, uh, Emil has over 25 years working at Oracle and has built up significant experience in an ever-growing list of technologies like the database, OCI, security, and multi-cloud. So um, I think it's really fair to say that between us, we've we've got such a history, haven't we, with, with the database, and we've all got around this 25 year experience mark. Um, so what was the first database version you started working with, Emil? 734. 734. On, on Windows. Like, on Windows, just like <laughs> me, just like me. Thomas? 716. I don't think he's younger than us as well. <laughs> okay, excellent stuff. So let's go forward and let's get started with uh, today's topic. So before we begin, we're just going to talk about the idea of a full stack versus a split stack. And the reason why we do that is because um, people can tend to like uh, interpret, have different interpretations of these. So uh, the, the splits, the full stack, sorry, is what we're showing first. And this is where we've got um, an Oracle database, typically on OCI, that would be talking to, um, let's say, the e-business suites, and it would interoperate with another full stack on Azure. Um, and this is where we have this stack-to-stack -stack communication. The benefit really is that it maintains high-performance connectivity uh, between those dependent applications. And the, you know, the reason why people do it is because they just want to have one particular workload interacting with two types of, of stacks and it doesn't require any re-architecture. So in, in the case of this typical uh, deployment, if you did have uh, data integration between the two in a batch processing sense, it's not of course you know, sensitive to the latency um, because it, it doesn't actually need that low connectivity and then it could be, for example, uh, Go, go ahead quite well and work quite nicely. If, we, if you then go forward, Emil, please, to the next um, split stack. So this is where we actually have the, um, the stack itself is then split across the two public cloud providers, this is our definition of it. And we have the application running on another public cloud um, with the Oracle database running on the Oracle cloud infrastructure. 
And now the benefit for this is that we're achieving the optimal performance together with the two cloud providers. Uh, we, we're taking the, the best of both technologies possible. So we're really making grounds with our innovation as a customer. And as well, we can leverage the, 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 the differences in the commercials as well by mixing and matching the services across the cloud. Now with the workload here, it's incredibly important that the, uh, there is a need obviously for low latency in this kind of split stack architecture and high throughput for network connectivity to achieve that application performance that we need. So um, this is where we have the uh, Oracle Database Service for Azure coming in. And Oracle Database Service for Azure, um, these particular databases that we're showing on the screen now is supported, um, you know, support, excuse me, the autonomous database, the exadata database service and the base database service. So these are our, you know, database cloud services, which provide very, very flexible options to you. And then you can choose the best database to run your application on. So if we just go to the left, we can see that we've got the autonomous database. Now we actually herald the autonomous database as the most easiest database service. And this can be deployed in a shared or a dedicated uh, Exadata model and it's absolutely fully managed. So what that means is Oracle performs all the manual tasks. We help you with the patching, we make sure you implement the, you know, the best configuration to ensure your application runs most efficiently at, at any scale. So what we're doing here is we're really taking care of, of you and making sure that the application is running at its optimal because we're eliminating that human error, human error element. And this takes any burden away from patching and deploying and offers you the best optimizations for high availability. So in the middle, we have the Exadata database service. This is our most flexible and with dedicated Exadata capability, what that means is that it's um, very, very flexible in the sense that it's comprised of your database and storage servers, which are completely dedicated to your database and to your workloads. Now, this is not a fully managed service like the autonomous. This is a co-managed service. So the advantage there is that Oracle will, will work together with you. We'll ensure that all your components are patched and automatically, you know, we automatically scan for vulnerabilities. And we provide you the patches or updates as required for the cloud. And when it comes, you know, when it comes to the VM, the OS grid infrastructure, you get to choose when to apply the patches to keep them up to date. Now we do urge that you keep them up to date as fully as possible to ensure that the application experience has the, you know, has the best experience uh, for both the application and the database. We support multiple workloads. Any workload from, for example, OLTP to analytics to anything in between. And here you have the advantage that you have full administrative control. Now, the last service, again, supported in Oracle Database Service at Azure is our most traditional service. And it runs on VMs on compute shared on the x86 platform. Unlike Exadata Service, it is a co managed service. So, again, we're providing you the patches with full admin control. And Oracle provides you the patches for your GIN database with all the database features available. So with the Oracle Database Service for Azure, we also have MySQL HeatWave available, but for the purpose of this uh, presentation, we're, we're talking about uh, our Oracle Database Cloud Services. Okay, next slide, please, Emil. So just to give a quick recap on what this service does, um, we, we have built this service um, really because we just want to ensure that any customer who has um, a partnership with Microsoft and has and runs the Oracle database has the, the most choice possible and best, best means of deploying an application and maintaining the Oracle database on Oracle where it runs best and utilizing the application in Azure. So back in 2019, Oracle and Microsoft, we forged a partnership um, with Microsoft and we did it because we wanted to provide again, like I've just said, our customers the best technology capabilities when connecting their workloads between Azure and Oracle with end-to-end -end latency. And as part of that, we have these 12 regions, that, the interconnect regions that we support. And they these particular regions are a service, the Oracle database service for Azure service, 
but they also service the OCI Azure Interconnect as well. So today, Oracle is really heavily investing in uh, in multi cloud and its partnership with Microsoft uh, to ensure that we are expanding this and driving innovation, performance, availability, regional availability as well, so that we can uh, give you this reduction in total cost of ownership and that you have these, you know, customers can benefit from running one workload spanning both. So how it works is in just a couple of clicks, um, ODSA connects your Azure subscription with your OCI tenancy. And what that does, it will automate the network configuration. It will use Azure Active Directory credentials if you so, so wish to do so to authenticate users across Azure and OCI. And ODSA creates a graceful coexistence of Azure applications connecting to the Oracle databases. Now, what this means is that the application then is it's running over one, it, it, it acts like it's running over one cloud. It's over a secure private high speed interconnect where we're really making sure that we're providing you that latency, that low latency that's required. And with Oracle Database Services and OCI, Azure users can not only simplify the development of innovative applications of the Oracle Database Converged Architecture, but these applications can really benefit from the fully managed elements, for example, of the Autonomous Database, experience the, the sheer scale out and performance capabilities of the Exadata platform, and achieve high availability uh, with Oracle Real Application clusters with the base database service as well. So that's just a brief overview of what the service does. So, I mean, let's go on to uh, talk about the hub and spoke network topology, which is the subject for today's talk. Okay. So with, with this particular topic, the reason why we're going, we're going to talk about this today is because um, this diagram here that you're looking at, it, it represents the Oracle database service, uh, Oracle database service for Azure architecture. So, this, as you can see, uh, uses a hub and spoke network topology, and we just want to explain what that is before we proceed. So this is where you have a central network zone, and it controls and inspects the ingress and the egress of the traffic between the zones, whether that's on the internet or on premises, for example. And it gives you uh, an effective way to enforce security policies as well, um, as, for example, segregation, isolation, um, because all these services, um, the hub will be, be will actually be contained in the hub, and these are the common services and components, and therefore you can actually manage these and administer them, which reduces the potential for misconfiguration and exposure. So uh, the Microsoft Azure Network design uses a hub and spoke um, topology, as I've already said. And the hub virtual network is the central point of connectivity for the traffic that enters and leaves the network. So like a north-south traffic and for the traffic within the network, which is east-west. The, the architecture itself has this highly scalable and modular design uh, for connecting multiple sp spokes, which is why um, Thomas is gonna get into the reasons why we've adopted this type of topology. Now the Exadata database service and base database services here. This is a, a customer representation whereby the peering relationship is between customers selected VNet and the VNet in the Oracle Azure tenant. So we have this network link created using the Oracle Interconnect from Microsoft Azure, which is this high performance, low latency, private tunnel connection, which we're gonna explain in a little bit for the network traffic. And that is dedicated per customer between OCI and Azure. So the VNet that the customer peers with is the spoke VNet, and that's dedicated. And from the spoke, we encapsulate the data and send it over the Oracle provision to interconnect and perform a similar process on the OCI side. Next slide, please, Emil. So here I just mentioned this tunnel. So we just want to talk a little bit more about that because you could see on the previous slide that we had, we had the tunnel in the middle, uh, which I spoke about regarding the network link. And here, this is where the Oracle Database Service for Azure establishes a private tunnel between Azure and OCI for each customer to give the customer the benefit of automated bandwidth sizing. This is exactly why we've done it, because this service is so different to any other service today in the industry. And it really provides you as a customer um, not only an, a managed connectivity service, but automated bandwidth sizing as well. 
And for this, it uses the generic network virtualization encapsulation called Geneva, which is a network virtualization overlay encapsulation protocol. And in a Geneva tunnel, on the diagram, we're showing that we've got this header and this additional header is used, which means that the size of the effective or the inner payload is reduced. Now let's have a look at the how this impacts MTU and PMTUD, which I'm going to now introduce. Next slide. Thank you. Emma. So the maximum transmission unit, as you can see on the slide, we've put a depiction up so you can see the, the headers and the payloads that we're referring to. Um, this is the size of the largest protocol data unit, the PDU, and that's what can be communicated in a single layer network transaction. So in a way, this is identical to a, uh, a maximum phrase size that can be transported over the data link. The standard internet MTU size is 1,500 bytes. Now this is very important for this topic here because this is the standard byte size for Azure. And Thomas is going to explain more about that later, but it's also many, you know, it's true for many corporate networks or many data centers, many clouds that actually have this as a setting set. Um, for example, although um, you may find it can differ, for example, our computer instances, instances and the Exadata database, so it's X9M, does use an MTU of 9,000 by default. So we spoke about the MTU. Let's just take a quick look at the path MTU discovery. So this, this stands for um, path MTU discovery, which is an automatic mechanism to discover the lowest MTU between two endpoints to automatically discover the lowest MTU on the path. And this, what it does, it its, its purpose is to avoid IP packet fragmentation between sending and the receiving of the hosts. Now, PMTUD uses ICMP to discover the maximum MTU value on the entire network path from end to end. So, as I just mentioned, the standard packet sent is 1,500 bytes in Azure, and on every next hop, the router will ascertain if the packet size is adequate to get through and communicate that basically through the ICMP. And this is at the heart of our topic today because of the overhead which occurs when using the Geneva tunneling, as I've just explained, in our Oracle database, so Azure architecture, it means that if we send a 1,500 byte packet from Azure to Oracle, the service router knows such a size won't get through due to the tunnel we use that encapsulates all this traffic. So now I'm going to hand over to, to Thomas, who's going to start with how PMTUD works with the most simplest case first. So he's going to be showing a direct peer network. And then Thomas is going to take us through the hub and spoke network, which is configured for PMTUD to draw a comparison for the best practices implementation. Take it away, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks for the explanation also already. Welcome. So yes. Um, we wanted to show a few use cases and how PM2D actually works. Uh, as Suzanne already mentioned, PM2UD is necessary for a connection built with uh, Oracle database for Azure uh, because of that overhead um, of the um, Geneva tunnel that we are using. Um, in this example, we see a direct peer network. That means that we are not using hub and spoke. Um, we are uh, directly peered into an application uh, uh, VNet. And uh, as you can see, the red arrow shows that um, the connection is, in, is, is initiated and um, uh, talks as the next hop talks to our service router, the service router of the Oracle database service for Azure. Um, this service router is uh, aware that a packet of 1500 bytes is too large to travel through the tunnel because of their overhead. So it returns a PMTUD packet. Um, PMTUD packet is then traveling uh, over the ICMP protocol. ICMP type three code four packeted, uh, packages are used for this. And using this, a negotiation starts between the service router and the application VM to establish the MTU for the connection. Now on the next slide, we see that, um, um, if Emil, uh, the next slide, we see that um, the ideal um, or the MTU possible for the connection that has been negotiated is 1360. And once that is established, uh, all packages sent from the application through the database will be limited to 1360 bytes. Um, 
and traffic can travel all the way from the application to the database service and back over the Oracle DB for Azure uh, tunnel. What's important to know is that this was a directly peered uh, VNet. So a directly peered VNet allows ICMP traffic um, coming from the, the other peered networks where you're directly peered into. Um, so there is no, no additional uh, configuration that needs to be done because this is allowed by default uh, in, in Azure. Now, going further to the um, hub and spoke uh, uh, topology. So if you use a hub and spoke topology on your Azure side connected to uh, the hub VNet connecting the Oracle database service or Azure V service VNet to your uh, hub VNet, you will see that the uh, connection um, initiation happens in two in two steps. So the first uh, uh, step is the application VM that uh, that sends a packet through the firewall. Firewall says, okay, it's okay, I can handle 1500. The next hub is service router that can handle 1500. So it uh, sends it to the next hub. However, service routers, again, uh, the same way, it says, no, it's, that's not possible. So um, we're sending back a package, ICMP, a, a type three code four package, which is the PMTUD packet, um, saying, okay, you need to lower your, uh, your MTU uh, to this size because otherwise it won't uh, travel over the tunnel. As mentioned before, for directly peered VNets, um, this is not an issue because traffic is allowed. Now for spoke VNets, who are actually allowing tra traffic between hub and spoke, so allowing ICMP between hub and spoke, that traffic is okay, but you can see that the, the service VNet that we are using for our Oracle DB for Azure is not directly peered into that spoke VNet. It is in fact a peer of a peer. And this is something that Azure does not allow by default. So by default, you cannot allow a specific, uh, 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 um, sorry, by default, it's not allowed to come from any network uh, to, uh, to come into that spoke VNet. That's why we need to add a specific rule to the network, uh, uh, the network security group of that spoke VNet, the NSG of that spoke VNet. Uh, once we allow that traffic to come in from our service router, then we can um, establish this connection because then we can, uh, we can um, uh, negotiate the MTU size that will be used over the connection. In this example, you see that we have enabled it for sp spoke VNet one and uh, VNet uh, and the MTU size is determined to be 1360 in this case. And again, the traffic flows from a sp a spoke VM or app application VM to the database and back. Now, in this case, this works, but a lot of customers also work with firewalls with multiple nodes. So if you go to that example, uh, you can see that uh, allowing the ICMP to travel from our service network to the spoke VNet is, it could not only be sufficient, right? Because if you have multiple nodes, you can, uh, of your firewall and the return traffic for the ICMP uh, package for PMTOD, right? In this case, uh, lands on a different node, then you could have asymmetric routing. In this example, the application VM goes uh, to, uh, uh, initiates the, the connection with uh, um, a PM, an MTU of 1500, goes to the first node of the firewall, uh, hits the service router and the service router returns traffic. Now, that service, uh, service router returns traffic to a load balancer between those two firewall nodes. And for some reason, it, it could land on the second node of that uh, firewall instead of the initial node where the initial connection was made. In this case, the firewall node two, it will, it will not know about the connection. It will say, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what you were talking about. And it will drop the PM2D package. Uh, the pm 2 PMTUD package, the will never reach the spoke VNet and the application. And in this case, you will see a hanging connection attempt. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Emil, we can show this, uh, how this is actually done in, 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 in Azure um, 
so if we go to the Azure um, portal here, so. Can I just say, Tom, sorry, um, if any of you have any questions, you can please feel free to leave them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. So carry on, Emil, thanks. Yeah, yeah, of course. I was uh, I forgot to mention that. No, no so problem. Sometimes Actually. it's <laughs> too fast. Now, so what we see here is a spoke vnet, which is configured by default. So these these are the uh, default NSG rules, uh, default network network security groups that you will see in a vnet, and you can see that uh, the virtual network uh, source and uh, destination uh, service tag here allows any traffic. So. It's what we, what we have mentioned for directly peer networks. You will see ICMP traffic being allowed coming from any directly peer network. So going directly into uh, ODSA uh, to Oracle Database Service for Azure VNet, that's not a problem. However, uh, this is a spoke VNet and this will give, give us a, a, an, an issue. Now, if you go to the second VNet that we have configured here, uh, Emil, and you go to the network security rules here, you will see that we have um, uh, introduced a, a specific rule uh, which allows ICMP traffic coming from um, this uh, carrier grade net address space. So uh, we are using the carrier grade ad net address space because yes, we do have a router uh, on uh, the service network, but this is also behind a, uh, a load balancer, and this can uh, this address can change. So if you, for maybe we could show that um, in ODSA you can or in the uh, portal you can um, find the network address of your router, and you will see that indeed this um, is located in that carrier grade net network. Now, just to be sure that all ICMP traffic uh, comes back. Uh, we want, uh, we ask you to, to set it to the 164 uh, carrier grade network. Now, um, uh, this is to solve the traffic between the VNets, but uh, we had another case that we showed uh, during the PowerPoint and that's uh, session persistence. So if you have a multi-node firewall, where you have uh, not uh, enabled system persistence, you can see that you have um, asymmetric routing. So it's so important to see and check the load balancing rules of your firewall to see if we have uh, session persistence enabled. So in this case, it's not enabled and we would need to enable it to allow the PMTVD traffic uh, to go through. So that's what I wanted to show you today. This is, I wanted to show you that uh, the way we resolve this is PMTD and how you can enable your uh, hub and spoke network topology and all the parts between it, uh, how, how to enable PMTD for those traffic. Emil, I'll let you uh, explain what happens if you can't do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. But before I explain what happens when you can't use PMTD, let's, let's just look at a quick example of, um, of, of what Thomas has just been talking about, right? So uh, this is the diagram that we've basically built. So we have that uh, on the top, on the top, on the top left side, we have that virtual machine in spoke one VNet, where as uh, we showed on the screen earlier, we have added that extra rule to allow ICMP traffic from the DB4 Azure service router to come into that virtual machine. On the other virtual machine on the bottom left, we have not set that set that rule. So if I go to both of those virtual machines, the one that is good is blue and the one that is not so good is or is orange. So on the orange one, so that is the one where we have just a default setup. It is in a spoke where we have not allowed explicitly to allow ICMP coming coming from that service service router. So if here I and I kind of say these are plain virtual machines. The only thing that is installed here is the, the uh, Oracle Instant Client, so that can SQL plus, no other tricks. Um, so if I want to SQL plus here to that database, I know the IP that the database uh, works on. Uh, I know my uh, demo user, etc. So this is an easy connect string that I'm using here. I type my password and that connection essentially just hangs or that connection attempt 
things because from this client the net the the, the network packets have reached the uh, ODSA router or the Oracle DB4 Azure router, uh, but the ICMP traffic that is being sent back to this client to tell this client to try with a smaller packet size basically does not arrive because I'm, I don't allow ICMP traffic to get here. So this connection attempt will just time out at some moment with uh, with a hang. If I do the same on the top virtual machine, the one in, 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 in blue, where I have allowed that ICMP to get through, I don't know if I type my password right. Then you can see exactly the same setup, no other differences apart from allowing that ICMP and I get straight through. So that shows you the importance of PM2UD and, and why PM2UD is, or and, and therefore ICMP, why that is important to get through. You see at the bottom now by the way that after one minute of attempting, SQL Plus just, SQL Plus just gives up and throws these errors. It's basically saying, well, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't get through, so try, try again. So I'm just gonna go back to the presentation here just, just for a couple of slides and I've got lots more demo. Um, so this is what we've looked at in this correct setup for the for the machine on the uh, on the on the top in that in that uh, spoke vnet one, but the one in spoke vnet two we did not set up ICMP. Now, so that demo we've just done. Um, now there were some reasons why you can't use PMTUD in in certain in certain circumstances. So Thomas has already mentioned, right, that um, if you have a multi-node firewall, so a fi firewall with with multiple VMs essentially uh, running running the, running the show, uh, you you need to set it up with session persistence. Otherwise, you get that asymm asymmetric routing back. Um, if this firewall doesn't allow you to to use session persistence, then you're going to get into trouble because uh, for some sessions it might get routed back over the correct node and they can connect and then you try again and the ICMP packet gets routed over the incorrect firewall node, let's, let's call it that, and therefore it gets that, that ICMP packet and gets dropped and that session does not work. So you get very inconsistent um, results in that way. Um, so if that's a situation where you have a multi-node firewall where you cannot set up session, session Persistence, PM2UD is basically not going to help you out. An example of that is the Azure Firewall Service. And this is quite a big limitation because the Azure Firewall Service is, of course, it's nice and easy to use as a firewall if you're if if you're in Azure. But inside the Azure Firewall Service, it is essentially a multi-node firewall, even though you only get one IP address that in the back end, there were still multiple nodes and that IP address that you get for the firewall is, 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 is essentially a load balancer that uses multiple nodes in the back end. Within Azure Firewall Service, there is no session persistence flag. It doesn't do session persistence effectively in the in the style that we needed here. So when you use Azure Firewall Service, you always get into into problems in with with this and you effectively cannot use PMTUD for the Oracle DB4 Azure service, if you do that in a hub and spoke model with Azure Firewall Service in the in the middle, um, there is no workaround for to get that to get PM2UD working. So we're going to need to find another method of get of or to to get that working, um, which I'll cover from the next slide onwards. Then the other reason uh, why you might not be able to to use PM2UD is uh, your security practices might simply not uh, not allow uh, to use ICMP coming coming from other networks uh, on the spoke free nets. A slight drawback in Azure is that you when you allow ICMP, you can only allow all of ICMP, all types and all and all codes. It's either off or on. Within OCI, in contrast. You can actually choose your types and codes of ICMP that you want to that you want to allow. Which why in a uh, OCI security list you always see ICMP type three code four, which is what PMTUD uses to be allowed. But that's the only one that is allowed by de by default. 
Um, so if on Azure you want to allow that, you automatically also allow all other ICMP types, which means that you allow ping and, and whatever else happens over ICMP. So you could have a security practice that says, no, we, do, we don't allow that. And then again, because of this, the, the way that the, that the rest of this, of, of, of this uh, service has been architected, you then run into trouble. So what to do about that? Essentially, as, as Suzanne and Thomas have explained, PMTUD is a aut automated method to establish what the maximum packet size can be uh, between the client and the, and the database in, in, in our case. So if you cannot use that, then the solution is to essentially do that manually, to, to manually force smaller packet sizes. Because if I manually force a smaller packet size, it means that no negotiation is needed to make it even, even, even smaller. I just need to manually set that packet size to fit through that tunnel between OCI and Azure, and then everything will be okay anyway. Then the fact that PMTUD maybe doesn't work in my environment for the limitations that we've mentioned, it, that then doesn't matter. So there are effectively two methods that we can use. And then we can choose where to apply them. So in total, two times two, there are four things that we can do about this. Um, so the, the two methods are, uh, firstly, we can, uh, at SQL net level, uh, play with the session data unit or SDU parameters to have SQL net make smaller network packets. And because they are then wrapped, they are wrapped up and go over the, over the uh, TCP IP link, uh, that, that leads to smaller packet sizes and no PMTUD is needed anymore. Now, of course, that will only work for SQL net connections. So your connection from a, uh, from a, for example, for SQL plus that I'm showing or your application, your application server, whatever it is that needs to connect to the database will be able to connect pro properly if you limit SDU size. What that doesn't solve is if you want to do other things, for example, you want to SSH, to the to the database server because you need to do some maintenance, you need to do some DBAing or whatever it is that you need to do, that still can't work. So for that to work, we have the second method, which is to manually set a limited MTU size on the network level. So that will capture all network traffic and therefore allow both SQL net because that also uses that, but also SSH, for example. And then, so those are the two main methods, which I'll show in a minute. And then we need to choose where to do that. Do we set that centrally on the, on the database server so that it applies for pretty much anything that connects to us? Or do we do that individually on the clients that we want to change, that want, that want, that want to make use of, of that? There is no right and wrong answer there. It will very much de depend on your setup, on your specific environment, what to use and where to use it. So. Um, as, a, as a demo, I will uh, do all four. Um, let me just go back to those machines. Just one thing which we might add, Emil, is that lowering those MTU uh, sizes manually, uh, in fact, has no impact to the performance, right? Because That's correct. Yeah. actually what we are doing here is we are doing a manual step uh, in, uh, instead of PMTUD being doing, doing it uh, when it would be available. So there is no performance impact on the connection for Oracle Database Service for Azure. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because what we're doing, what PMTUD would do is find out what is the maximum size, and it's trying to get that maximum size through the tunnel. The, the tunnel limits the maximum size of the packets to whatever the maximum is. But um, so what we're doing here manually is just setting manually achieving exactly the same re result. So it's not like we're doing MTU tuning or SDU tuning or any of those sorts of things. We're, 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 we're eff effectively just saying, I know that on my network link, I have limited limited size and therefore I, I, I need to set the parameters to, uh, uh, fit, to fit into that limited size. Absolutely. Right, so uh, again, I have the good client up. Uh, I, that's not very uh, uh, useful in this case. So I'm going to be uh, using at the bottom one, the one that wasn't connected, that wasn't set up with the um, with allowing IC, ICMP. So we saw earlier in that SQL plus uh, statement that, that that connection attempt just 
just hung. So I'm going to first of all do the two methods from the client. So the first method is to, base, to set the SDU size. Now that is very simple in SQL Plus from the client. If you use an easy connect string like I'm using here, you can basically just add the parameter at the end there. I'm just using 1300 now to have it nice and small and it definitely will be getting, will be getting through. Um, that's just a way to set extra parameters on an easy connect string. If you use a traditional TNS name store, or uh, then you can also add it there. It's, it's, it's just one of the parameters that you can that you can add on the uh, on the client. So when I try to connect with that, and I type my correct password, and you can see that in exactly the same environment that I had earlier, where automatically I didn't come through because PMTUD doesn't work. If I just set the SDU size, I get through very happily. I exit out of that, and I'm going to see if I can SSH to that same machine. Oh, if I type the IP address right, so you can see that that still hangs because with SSH I can't I can't set the MTU or the SDU size and all that sort of stuff. So what I've got to do here is I've got to work on the um, uh, on the on, with the IP com command. I need to sudo that so I can use IP IP root. And I can basically say on my route to my database server, uh, which lives on 10.20.0.0 slash 24. So that's the side range of my database server, uh, which you can see that the actual IP is 10.20.0.188. So that's in that side range. So in my route to that, um, to, to, to that side range, um, and then the IP command, I need to get the right one here uh, via 10.40.2.1. This is the um, this is the gateway of the network that this client machine is in. And now I can just say MTU 1300. That's been added. And now when I do an SSH to that machine, I just get in. I have preloaded the key here to uh, to SSH to this machine, so it's not going to ask me for using for use for usernames and passwords. Um, so you can see there that that simply that using the IP co the IP command to limit the MTU size on this connection from this client to to that whole CIDR range, which is the whole network that that that, that database machine is is in, that helps me to be able to do any Connection. So I did SSH there, and now I can, of course, also do the normal SQL SQL plus. I don't have to set the SDU anymore, and that also then lets me in. So that's nice and easy. So from the client, that's nice and easy. I'm going to delete this route again because now I want to show basically doing the same thing from the server. So let me just double, double, double check. Yeah, and that hangs again. So I had those two methods from the client. Uh, on the, on the, uh, I've deleted that route again. So now I can't, boom, can't connect. Let me now use the my good client to also SSH to the machine to the database. There we go. And I'm gonna, so blue is now the database server and orange is still the bad client. And I'm gonna make changes now on the database server to allow the client to connect without having to make changes on the client it's, itself. So this is the central version of what we did earlier. So first of all, we're gonna, we're gonna, do, um, uh, we're gonna do the SDU again. And for that, we're gonna uh, go in as Oracle, and we're going to go and edit the SQL Network Aura file in my uh, data, in my database home. So this is the SQL Network Aura used by the database, not the SQL Network Aura used by uh, Grid. So you can see that I've actually pre prepared this already. I've got this default SDU size parameter that is set there. It was uh, uh, hashed out, so it wasn't in use before. Um, so otherwise that would have been cheating, right? Um, but I'm going to remove that now, that hash, and I'm going to make that active. I'm going to save, save that. So 
that's now in there. And without having, without doing anything else, I'm going to go back to my orange client here, and I'm going to try to do my SQL plus. Note that this is all live. This has not been pre-recorded. So there we go. We are we are we are straight in. So what we can see here is that just setting that default SDU size on the database server also allows my client to connect. So if I had a thousand clients that wanted to connect and it wouldn't be feasible to make all those changes individually on all of those clients, I could just have done it on the, I can just do it on the database server and that still allows me in. However, of course, I still can't SSH because this is only SQL, uh, SQL net that has been edited. So let me just not cheat and get that back, right? So now we won't work again. And I'm gonna go back to um, the normal OPC user here. So now I'm gonna use the same, um, let me find the right statement. Here we go. So I'm gonna go uh, pretty much the opposite of what I did on the client earlier. I'm gonna uh, add a route to the IP range that is that my orange client is in, the, the IP range of the network that I is in. So that's 10.40.2.0 slash 24. And I'm gonna go via the um the gateway. So I lost the word gateway there, via the gateway that this database service server is in. So that's 10.20.01. And I'm also setting MTU to 1300 there. So once I do that. And I'll go back to the orange client. I can, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I can SSH to the database server and in I get my exit there for completeness. I'll also do the SQL plus com connection in any of those work. So there you have it. And those, those two methods, either using SQL plus or using the network settings for M for MTU done either from the client or from the data or from the database server. Now, one thing to keep in mind, let me just go back to the presentation here, that the combination of server side and MTU does not work for the exadata service. So when you use the exadata service, you're gonna have to, if you want to do it on the server side, you're gonna have to use the, 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 S, the SDU method effectively, or you can do it on the client side. And in general, I would say, like I said earlier, there, there is no right and wrong in how to do this, but generally uh, the recommended combination, if you do not have a reason to do it otherwise, is to use the SQL net settings. So the default SDU size on the server to allow all database connections coming in from anywhere to successfully establish a connection to the database. And that is typically like 95%, 99% of the traffic to the to the database machine will be SQL net, right? So that solves almost all of your problems. And then for those individual DBAs that need to be able to SSH or do other stuff to the database servers, then on those clients, you can also then set the IP route uh, to limit the MTU size so that they can SSH and do other things than just SQL, SQL, SQL net. So it's a combination of server side for all of the SQL net stuff and uh, client side for those who need extra to also do MT, MTU. That will be our recommended combination of these two things. But like we said, your situation might be slightly different and you might, might have another combination or, or just have one through one of these solutions that you can uh, that you can use. Thanks very much, Emil, for explaining that and the various configuration types, especially in the context of Exadata, because uh, obviously that's one of the database services that we're supporting and, yeah. and part of this topic. So thank you. Let's turn over to you, Thomas, because uh, I see that you and Emil have written this comprehensive blog that details everything you've gone through to today. So do you just want to take away and speak about that for a little bit. Yes, indeed. So we have we have uh, written a blog, um, and the one that you see here, and it's already published, is the one 
uh, that we use to explain uh, PMTOD on a hub and spoke network and why why it's needed and uh, how do you need to implement it. Another one who did not get uh, published in time is the is, is in fact handling the um, the uh, 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 the ways on how to resolve this uh, the methods on how to resolve this when PMTOD is not available, but we will soon refer to that blog in, in this blog. So um, uh, watch out for, for the, the other one coming. So if you need any documentation to go back to, you can certainly refer to these blogs. Thanks, Thank Norman. you, Suzanne. Um, I noticed that we don't have any questions at, at the moment in the Q&A, maybe we've blown everybody away. <laughs> maybe we've answered everything, um, I'm, uh, but I urge you to, uh, pop some questions in if you have anything outstanding. I just want to say uh, that we have this uh, external Slack channel and we'd really love you to, to join in our discussions here. Uh, we do uh, connect with our customers very well and we get a lot of great interaction on this channel, including um, a feature that we've also implemented, which is our AI chatbots and they're called Ask Ed and Ask Debbie. Uh, and, and they'll, you know, provide any uh, answers to your questions about the DBAS CLI or the OCI CLI. And uh, it's a, just a great way that we use as a Slack channel to broadcast announcements, publish any blogs uh, once they've been released. So it's our single source of getting information out to you to our database cloud services the fastest. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions in Q&A right now. We'll give it a minute uh, to see if anybody wants to ask anything. I mean, we also are knowledgeable on Oracle Database Service so Azure as well. So if you have any questions about the service in general, please feel free to ask, and uh, not just about the topic we've just presented. But I, I think this topic was very, very worthwhile because uh, like we said originally, uh, it, it is imperative you know what you're doing and how you're actually configuring the network uh, because otherwise the danger is, as Emil and Thomas have very well demonstrated today, is that you can get these hanging connection attempts, um, which is the last thing that anybody wants when we're actually doing this. So I think, yeah, that's it. There's no questions. So I'm going to draw the uh, session to a close. Thank you very, very much, Thomas and Emil, for your, for your uh, time today and presenting on, on this session. It's much, much appreciated. And uh, we collaborate very closely anyway, and I look forward to collaborating with you again in soon, again soon in the very near future. Likewise. <laughs> Thank you. And to the whole audience. Thank you very much for everybody for joining us. I was about to close with. Uh, we hope to see you next time uh, for the next session. And, uh, you know, this is the idea behind this multi cloud happening is to present diverse topics. So it doesn't just focus on the Oracle database service for Azure, but also focus, focuses on all multi cloud aspects when we are working with the database uh, in this split stack architecture. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good day. Bye bye.